Introducing Dr. Daniel Sanderson, Red Cliff Clinical Director. Obviously, the Red Cliff experience has been quite an event for your child. And, you know, absolutely, it's been an amazing sacrifice for you to have your child here. So we uh, want you to know what has actually happened. How can you characterize the nature of this experience for your child? And how can you use the Red Cliff experience in assisting you to make decisions from this point forward? Obviously, we're not done. We're finished with Red Cliff. But We've gotten to a place where there is a new beginning, and now where do we go from here? How do we know where we need to go from here? And the second goal is more immediate, maybe more practical here for today's circumstance, in that I want you to have within the first 20 minutes of being reunited with your child a way of assessing for yourself really how far along have they come at Radcliffe. To begin this, I would like to ask you a question, and it's one that I get hit with all the time, depending upon the audience that I'm addressing, whether it's um, you know, other parents, um, educational groups, educational consultants, other mental health professionals, when they find that uh, I will be addressing them about Radcliffe or the kinds of things that we do here at Radcliffe. One of the first questions I hear is, so tell me, what kind of kid goes to Redcliffe Ascent? <laughs> what kind of kid is here, right? What kind of kid would need to come here? Now, here you all are as parents of individuals, of children, adults, or there's one adult parents here someplace, that, uh, that have been here at Redcliffe. And when someone comes to you and asks you that question, how do you answer? What do you think? What kind of kid comes to Redcliffe Ascent? I didn't hear any of you say, well, you know, the kids that come to Redcliffe Ascent are oppositional defiant disordered kids, all right? They are conduct disordered kids. They, have, they, are, they are kids who have any number of mood disorders or anxiety disorders, okay? They are kids who have a full range of substance abuse disorders. Okay, I didn't hear any of you telling me about their diagnosis, right? And, and I think as you have discovered as parents, really, that concept of diagnosis or the various diagnoses that have been thrown your way are of only minimal, uh, I guess we could say, help okay, in, in, in being able to really determine what's going on with my child. Okay, how, do, how do I understand this? And, and the reason why I bring this up and the reason why this is important is because obviously the nature of the treatment that we will be providing is going to be largely contingent upon how we actually define what is the problem, okay? What is the situation that created the problem that needs the treatment? So if we're talking just purely about a diagnosis, then obviously the kind of treatment that we're going to be providing for that diagnosis is, is going to be maybe a little bit different. Now, this, this, this kind of uh, sets a, a situation for us. It's a bit of a conundrum for us, right? Because your children will come to the program. Most of them already bring a diagnosis with them. You know, this is not usually the first time that you've been involved with the system in one way or another. Yet, every one of your children are unique. Even though they have similar diagnoses, the kinds of behaviors that they have been demonstrating that earned them that diagnosis are different. They all come from unique family backgrounds. All of you have different expectations for your children. How do we treat unique individuals? What is that common thread that runs through all of here? Well, like you said, and like that very astute uh, therapist pointed out to you that you know, all of these individuals, all of these kids, the common thread that binds them together is the fact that they have all found a way to successfully avoid their developmental progression. Or, as we have pointed out, these are children. These are children who are on developmental vacation.
The behaviors that we typically see that earn them those diagnoses that we talk about are specifically those kinds of behaviors that allow them to stay on developmental vacation. Right? Now what does this mean? This whole developmental vacation thing means that they have found some place between their childhood and early adulthood that they have decided that they're just going to stop. Okay? Here's my comfortable place. This is where I want to be. Here is my opportunity to be able to stay in Disneyland for the rest of my life and have somebody else constantly paying my all-day pass. Okay? That's really what that's all about. So, as long as I am on developmental vacation, it means that I am not involved in acquiring the wisdom, the competencies, the abilities, the discipline, the coping mechanisms that I actually am going to need in order to manage my life as a young adult. Okay? I'm not having those kinds of experiences that allow me to garner those kinds of important aspects of my life. It's not happening. I am staying on vacation and I have the expectation that someone else now is going to intervene in my life for me. So instead of developing the coping mechanisms, the healthy coping mechanisms that I need, the wisdom, the competencies, the discipline that I need, the thing that I am doing more than anything is fostering dependencies, okay? A bunch of dependencies. I have a dependency on other human beings that they will compensate for my lack of involvement in my life. I have a dependency on society that society will allow me to stay on developmental vacation. I have a dependency on my friends that they will continue to foster me in this role that I have, I have uh, developed for myself. I have a dependency upon substances, drugs and other substances as well, okay, that allow me so that I, you know, I never really have to deal with any of the anxiety that comes along with the fact that realistically I'm expecting to be about an eight-year-old for the rest of my life. Okay? That's what I'm doing. I'm developing dependencies. Now, when uh, we come to this understanding that this is where these children are, and we want to apply some treatment to this situation. Now, what is the kind of treatment that we're going to apply? Well, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of treatment that are available, but none of them will have any effect whatsoever until we can be successful in disrupting whatever that pattern is in place that allows that child to maintain that developmental holiday, right? Until we can disrupt the developmental holiday, nothing is going to take place. Now, how do we know when this is actually happening? Is there a way that we can determine, okay, I, you know, I kind of have a, a bit of a sense here, of where my child started with all of this. I can envision where they are on their developmental holiday. But are there some specific markers that I could look at that would give me some indications that they are moving beyond where they might be? And maybe even at that, are there markers that we could examine that would allow us to determine where they need to be, where ideally we want our kids to be, where we might be even as well? How do we, how do we uh, determine where one might be on this developmental march towards maturity? And those are the things that we're going to need to talk about today because that's the stuff you're going to need to know to be able to determine where your child actually is now that they have been through this kind of an experience. All right, now the way that we will approach this then is we need to, sh we need to have a shared language. And uh, I'm, I'm going to, uh, we're going to talk about some terms here that, that to some degree may not be familiar to you, but on another aspect, they will be very, very familiar to you. They will be familiar to all of us because we're going to use a language that's kind of couched in relationships to understand how to look at this. And the reason that this will be familiar to all of us is that none of us have been able to escape our relationships, right? There is none of us that are living on this, uh, on this planet as the sole occupant of this planet. 
You know, we, none of us are living on our own little planet where we are the sole occupant. No, we're here on Earth with everybody else. So whether we like it or not, it was inescapable to us. And the first thing that we encountered as human beings was were those relationships. And we have a myriad of relationships. And as we look at it, we can actually use our relationships to help us determine where we are with our individual issues. You know, it's pretty easy to do. If our primary relationships are supportive of us being able to go through that whole process of self-actualization, whatever that might be, you know, that allows us to go out there and find out what life truly has in store for us. Okay? If, if those are the kind of relationships that we have, then it's a good indication that we probably have a pretty good handle on our own individual issues. If our primary issues, however, are those kind of relationships that take every last drop of energy that we have just to maintain the relationship, so that there's really nothing left over for us to go out and find out what else is out there, okay? And, and, you know, everything that we do just goes into the maintenance of the relationship. That's probably a pretty good indication right there that we have some work to do on our own individual issues, right? So let's try and understand this, especially in this developmental perspective that we've been talking about, all right? Now, what does this look like when we first land on the planet? Well, when we initially arrive, we really don't even have the neural capacity at that point to begin thinking about ourselves in separate terms, or thinking about ourselves and, and, and how we relate to everything else around us. You know, to the limits of our perception, the kinds of things that we encounter out there are merely considered to be an extension of us, more or less, everything that we encounter. Somehow that's just an extension of us. We have no way to make any kind of separation there, right? So, you know, the uh, other human beings that kind of float in and out of our lives, well, obviously an extension of us, as are all of these other inanimate objects. Everything that we encounter in our life, somehow, extension of us. And at that point, we really do not have the capacity to take care of ourselves. If we're going to be okay, we are completely dependent upon someone else. Absolutely. The only thing that we really can do is evoke particular responses in other human beings. But that's pretty much it at that point in our development. So, you know, really, there is no actual separation at that point, or even sense of separation at that point, between us and the rest of the world. You know, we are just a part of this huge amorphous blob that's out there, this kind of me, you thing. That, that's out there, and you know, at that point, in a practical sense, we are pretty much dependent upon everyone else to make sure that we are okay. Now, we have to go down the road here just a little bit. As we are developing and we are making more of those neural connections there in our cerebral cortex, and, uh, and, and we, we become more aware of our surroundings and our language begins coming together. And we find that we have the capacity at this time to start thinking in representational terms. Okay, now it's very rudimentary initially, but it, it's important that we get to this spot. It's important where we get to this realization that this word that people seem to keep calling me over and over and over and over is actually my name. All right? And as I am becoming more and more kind of rewarded or reinforced when, when I say verbalizations like mama and dada, those kinds of things, everybody's getting real excited about all that. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to pick up the idea that, that people around me and the things around me actually have names. You know, there is a way to categorize all of these things in my life. I'll sit around with that CNC for hours, you know, pulling the string. The cow says moo. Okay, because this is an important time in my life. I really am trying to put everything into a category, if I possibly can. And it starts dawning on me, all right, the categories. There's the category of me, okay, there is me, and then there's everybody else. So I, I'm getting the sense that, there, that I'm physically separated to some degree from everyone else in my life, 
right? And, and that I am not actually the same person as everyone else. Nevertheless, even though I can make that distinction of physical separateness, the piece that remains with me is that whole idea that I continue to be the center of the universe and it's everyone else's job to make sure that I'm okay. All right? I, I, I still am that center around which everyone revolves. And so, uh, you know, I have the expectation that others have no problem whatsoever providing for me whatever it may be that I think that I need. And if I need something or if I want something, it should be there immediately, right? <laughs> That's how that works. And so I still have this sense that if I'm going to be okay, somebody else is going to make me okay, but they should be happy to do that. It's their job to do that. Now, isn't this pretty much a nice description of about a two- and three-year-old child? This is that stage in our life. And we have to see ourselves at that time. It's important that we do see ourselves at that time as the center of the universe. All right? We have to have that notion running through our heads that we really do have all of that influence in the world. Because if we did have an actual awareness of how helpless we are in this huge world, it would be overwhelming to us. We would have absolutely no way of coping with that at that time in our lives. So we, you know, we start this whole process with the idea that here I am as the center of the universe and no one else knows about me better than I do. No one else knows what I need better than I know what I need. No one else in the world is cuter or smarter <laughs> or, or more talented or should be the center of attention better than I should be. Right? That's how we start this process. Now, as we move down the road, however, and when we're moving in towards late adolescence, all right, ideally we want to have a more reality-based orientation around all of this. Okay? Something that looks more like this, where I have this independent sense of who I am. I have this independent identity that I have, have begun to create in my life. This notion that I, I am a distinct individual apart from you. All right? And the identity that I have created is not necessarily, it's not contingent upon who you are. More importantly, I have an independent sense of well-being where I have now discovered that if I am going to be okay, it will be my responsibility to ascertain whether or not I'm okay. That's not your job any longer, okay? It's not your job, it's not the rest of the world's job to make me okay. If I'm going to be okay, I have to take responsibility for doing that. That's my job to do that. Now, ideally, I, I, I bring this up because we want to have a firm understanding of this in place by the time that we hit our late adolescence. That's the ideal here that we're looking for. The reason why that is important is because when we move from late adolescence to our young adulthood, the primary developmental task that we have as human beings changes significantly at that point. Right? We've been given this period of time in our lives as children and adolescents to come to that understanding of who we are, apart from everybody else. Who am I really? Okay? Now, this is a task that will remain with us to some degree for the rest of our lives. But as soon as we become young adults, it's no longer the primary developmental task. Okay? Our primary developmental task now moves into that of figuring out, gee, how do I take this human being that I have become and move towards genuine intimacy with a selected few in my life. Right? You know, and when we're talking about moving towards genuine intimacy, it's that whole idea that you know, at some point I'm going to be establishing myself with my, par with my partner or my spouse you know, in, in, in one of those kinds of committed types of roles. And I will be establishing myself, perhaps, as the head of a household with my own children, and will be having relationships with them as well as their parent. 
Now, if, if I am actually moving towards genuine intimacy, it means that I have to figure out how do I have genuine relationships with the other adults in my world? Now, am I going to be an, an intimate, am I going to have intimate kinds of relationships with all the other adults that I encounter? No, no. But in order for me to move into genuine intimacy, I've got to figure out how do I have genuine relationships with the other adults in my world. Relationships with others around me that do not depend upon them making me okay. okay? That's what I've got to figure out. That's my task of young adulthood. Now the thing about this is, and the piece that we want to avoid is if I do not have this sense, this independent sense of who I am with an independent sense of my own well-being and my capacity to provide that for myself, right? When I move into young adulthood, the kinds of relationships that I begin developing are going to look just like this, okay? Only on an adult level, which is certainly a lot different than when I'm starting out here as a four-year-old with my parents and everybody else in the world. Okay? Because this, as an adult, is essentially a picture of me hanging around with you. Okay? And I am hoping and cajoling and waiting for you to do all of these things that I need you to do to make me okay. Right? And you're hanging around with me, hoping and waiting and cajoling me to do the things that you want me to do so that you will be okay. Now, in the midst of this, both of us are going to be completely miserable. <laughs> but you know what? The misery is what keeps our relationship together. You know, because neither of us will take responsibility for this misery. It's not my fault I'm miserable. Heck no, it's your fault. If you would just get your stuff together and do whatever it is I want you to do, then I would be fine. All right? So obviously, this is the kind of relationship in adulthood that we are attempting to avoid. Right? It's, it's those very enmeshed kinds of codependent relationships that we talk about. So we can see then the importance of not hanging around on a developmental vacation in here for very long. <laughs> right? We want to get on with the business of life and get to a place here where we can come to that independent understanding of who we are. Now, before we start forming those, those very, very important relationships that we're going to have in our life. Right? Is that making sense so far? All right. Very good. Now, let's talk about how do we go from this? How do we get from that three, four-year-old little child here to where we have this independent sense of who we are about the time we're about 20, 21? You know, we kind of like to have that dialed in. Well, there's a couple of other critical periods here that we need to talk about. The first one starts, oh, about five, six, seven, someplace in there. It's usually coincident with our exposure to school and the myriad of other relationships that we encounter in that, uh, you know, in that place, in that environment. Now, when you think about this, really, about the time that we get to be four years of age, we really have it dialed in. We know our way around our own backyard. Okay? We, we have some sense of predictability to, to the degree that it can be there about who's going to be in, involved in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, how they're going to interact with us, and what it is that we need to do to maintain that sense that we have so much influence over everything that's going on. Now, if we are actually reared in an environment that is very nurturant, that is providing for those primary needs that we have, you know, where, where we have parents that are paying attention to us, and you know, things are going pretty well for us, of course we will attribute all of that good stuff to us. Yes, of course this is the way it should be. I deserve this, right? And I am in control, and things are running fine. I have no complaints. You are all doing very well, okay? You know, essentially that's what's going on. I will attribute you know, any control over that situation to me. Now, the inverse of this is also true. If I am being reared in an environment that is very unpredictable, one that is abrasive, <laughs> one that is not 
actually meeting my primary needs, where I'm being exposed to instances and, and experiences that are beyond my developmental capacity to manage them, okay? If I'm being reared in an environment like that, I will also attribute that to me as well. Okay? As a four-year-old, I have no capacity to step outside of that environment and say to myself, oh my gosh, my parents are making some really bad decisions here. Okay? No, no, not at all. I do not have that ability. So if, if I am experiencing some trouble and some turmoil in my life at that time as, as a young child, somehow or another, that will be attributed to me because I have all of that influence. Absolutely, I have no way of separating myself from that. So taking this understanding now, and we go out on the road. Here we are at school now. And here are all of these relationships that we are encountering that are unlike those that we've grown accustomed to in our own families, in that, in that primary environment. You know, the adults there, are certainly, well, we hope that they are going to be helpful, friendly, you know, well-intentioned individuals that we encounter there, but they're certainly not going to treat us like our parents do. Okay? And on top of that, now here are, uh, uh, here's a huge contingent of our peer group, all of whom have the audacity to assume that they are the center of the universe, and they don't rightfully recognize that as being my place here, right? And so now we have all of these worlds colliding as we are scrambling to kind of determine what is this social structure really all about, and how do I do this whole thing? So, Really, it boils down then to a conflict that we have at that time, that we have to resolve this one way or the other. There's two sides of this conflict. On the one side here is all of this material that is raining down upon our heads, telling us that whether we like it or not, we really are just little kids, okay? <laughs> you know, as we go to school, we're finding out gosh, I really don't have a whole lot of intellectual influence in the world. <laughs> you know, I'm being asked to do things that I've not ever had to do before. That, that they're asking me to think in, in like arithmetic terms. I'm struggle, struggling with phonics. I'm struggling to learn how to read. I'm having a hard time just sitting still for six hours every day in my desk. Okay? Yeah, I, I, you know, so maybe it is that I, I really am not as smart as I thought that I was, that there's a lot of stuff that I'm learning that I didn't, didn't even really know I didn't know at that point, right? Okay, so I don't have a lot of cognitive or intellectual influence in the world. You know, the second thing that I'm finding out is that I don't have a lot of physical presence in the world either, that I am physically just a small human being. I can't drive cars, I can't move heavy things around, I might even be getting hassled by third graders out on the playground. I don't really have all that physical influence that I thought that I may have had. And the other piece becomes particularly apparent when there is something that I need, something in, in particular that I think is going to enhance my social presence with everyone else, some kind of an accoutrement that's going to make life better for me. I've got to have the right sneakers, I've got to have the right backpack, the right clothes, I've got to have the Yu-Gi-Oh cards, whatever that might be that I independently cannot get that for myself. <laughs> I don't have any economic influence on the world at all. Somebody else has to provide that for me. So I have all this stuff that's saying to me, gosh, guess what, you're just a little kid. But on the other hand of this, on the other side of this conflict, is this other piece over here that's saying, no, 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 no. You are the center of the universe. And you must maintain that position at all costs. All right? So it's quite a conflict that we have to resolve. And really, the way that this conflict gets resolved or does not get resolved is, is going to provide for us a course through our childhood and adolescence. Now, let's talk about the ideal way in which this conflict gets resolved. And of course, as we are talking about this, we are talking about it in adultomorphic terms, right? Because when this is happening to us, we're not thinking about it in these kinds of terms, right? Now, now here we are as adults and parents and everything, and you know, having been through this ourselves, we're looking back now and we have a way of, of at least describing this whole thing. And the ideal way of resolving the conflict is 
for us to have this experience where we more or less grasp the idea, okay? The evidence becomes overwhelming to us. Yes, oh, I am just a little kid. Now, the thing that makes it so, this is not overwhelming to us any longer. Remember, if, we'd, if we had to know this back when we were just born, up to one, two years of age, oh, that, that's impossible. That would have been impossible for us to take that. We would have had no coping mechanisms to be able to manage that, okay? But so here we are, five, six, and seven, and we're thinking, ah, okay, I understand that I'm just a little kid, but the piece that makes this okay is that from my position down here as a little kid, I've had an increased awareness. I guess the, the way of describing this is, is that from this position, I look up, okay? I look up and I see these other individuals in my life, right, who really do have a whole bunch of influence in the world. Okay, they are physically large human beings. They do drive cars and move heavy things around. Okay, nobody's hassling them. <laughs> they, they seem to have all kinds of cognitive and intellectual abilities far beyond mine. They're not stumped by my homework. You know, if I am struggling with something, they seem to know the answer. And obviously, and most importantly, they know where the money tree is planted, right? <laughs> if there's something to be had, they are the ones that are going to provide that for me. Okay, So I look up and I see these individuals. Hopefully I see them as independently responsible adults in my life who are actually masterfully wielding all of this influence that they have in the world. Right? And, and I see that, yes, it really truly is possible to have all of that influence that I once thought that I did have. You know, I'm willing to recognize as a little kid that I don't have it. I see that it's possible to obtain. Now I must answer the question, how do I obtain access to that influence? Right? How do I do that? And that now becomes this task that, <clears throat> excuse me, that I have as a child. Now, this is an important spot to be. When I get to a place where we can actually more or less start the cognitive component of therapy with your children, you know, when they're here and we're actually get to that place where we've disrupted the process and we can genuinely start the process of therapy, the way that I like to talk to them about this is I, I would say to them, well, look, John, it's really easy to understand. All you have to do is just imagine yourself being the participant in this fairy tale, right? You are the, uh, um, the dashing young prince or the beautiful young princess, whichever the case may be, living in this absolutely gorgeous kingdom okay, that is presided over by the goodly king and queen who are your father and mother. <laughs> now, the underlying assumption is, of course, at some point in your life, you are going to take over the kingdom. Okay? That's the given in all of this. But before this can happen, you have two specific tasks that must be accomplished. The first is a task of childhood, and the second is a task of adolescence. And you can't get to that second one until you finish up with the first one. You've got to resolve that first one. So let's talk about that first task, the first task of childhood. So your first task of childhood then, Johnny, is that you must discover for yourself, you must come to that firm understanding for yourself, that your mother and father have your best interest in everything that they do. Right? Now you might be thinking to yourself, gee, out of everything that kids have to do when they're little kids, how does that get to be that primary task What's so important about that? Well, it's extremely important. Let's look at this. Let's go back and remember what we were saying about this, this kid that's two and three years of age. And, re and remember that we identified that individual as someone who has, has no concept that anyone else knows better about what it is they want or need than they do, right? That they are the smartest individual in the universe, that they know more than anybody else about what's best for them. And, and you think about those kinds of interchanges that you have with a three-year-old, okay? When a three-year-old has this incredible amount of energy that is just welling up inside of them, 
with every fiber of their being, it is telling them, I want that and I want it right now, okay? And when a parent comes along and says, no, Johnny, we're not going to have that right now. Once again, there is no place for that child to step out of that interchange and say, oh, okay, well, you know, my mom loves me, and she obviously knows what's best for me, so I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and defer to mom because she knows better than me. No, that's not what happens, okay? When someone tells me no, they're not just telling me no, they are actually attacking my very existence, okay? They are threatening to erode the very sense of self that I have. So when someone tells me no, I'm not just responding as though they are telling me no and I'm disappointed. No, it's a threat to me. And it feels like I am being attacked, and so I will respond in kind. And it becomes an amazing contest. I'm going to war, folks. That's what's happening here. You know, it's, and, and it really is a matter of me having to win in order to maintain the sense of being that I have. Okay, so we start with this position. And now I am going to put my parents through this amazing series of challenges <laughs> that, that continues on and on and on and drives my parents completely crazy. Okay? And, and sometimes my parents are going to be confused about what is actually happening here. It will not make any sense to them, but it will make sense to me because I have to do this according to my developmental level, okay? To, according to the capacity that I have to really process whatever this is that's going on, right? So it starts at that three and four year old level, two, three and four year old level, and it moves on throughout my childhood. And it seems like it never ends, but you know, it's, it's an important part of this process. Now, if you, if you really want to see what this looks like, it's easiest to see it manifest in those relationships between fathers and sons. Okay? Because you know, while it's, it's kind of the same process with parents of either gender, with children of either gender, there is that built-in component of competition that seems to be there in, in, you know, it's that, that male piece that comes along with, with fathers and sons. So it's more overt. You know, I think about, uh, for instance, my, my own son, who is, uh, who is now 13, and he's, he's my youngest child. And, uh, you know, there was a period of time in our relationship together, starting at about age three. You know, there was this little game that he started at, at about that point where, you know, when he would see me driving up from work or he'd be actually waiting for me to come home, he'd see me driving up, he'd run someplace in the house and hide, right? And so I'd walk in the house, and every time I did this, I kind of felt like Inspector Clouseau in those old Pink Panther movies, right? Because <laughs> I knew as soon as I walked in the house that Cato was going to come crashing out of the closet someplace, you know, and there's going to be this big row, right? And that, that's what happened. I'd be walking down the hall, and, you know, here'd come my son, you know, and I, I can remember when about four or five, he had this Power Ranger suit, you know? He'd come running down the hall in the Power Ranger suit with a flying sidekick, you know, when we'd have to chase each other around the house and we'd wind up wrestling around out in the living room or whatever it would be. But it was never ending. You know, when I was home, the game seemed like it was always on. And it drove his older sisters and his mother completely crazy because it was never ending. There was always something. I'd sit down, he'd steal my hat, you know, when we'd have to you know, run around, I'd be walking around outside, I'd come around the corner of the house, poof, you know, there's the old water balloon, you know, and you know, on and on and on. But, you know, it starts at a very basic level. It starts my son determining, well, at the very least, I can count on my dad not killing me, okay? <laughs> right? It's got to start at that very basic, you know, it's like, no matter what happens, my dad is at least not going to actually kill me. Right? I can dump a water balloon on my dad, and he may chase me down and soak me with the hose, but he's not going to pick me up and you know, toss me down the stairs or something. He's not going to hurt me. In every, in every situation, I know my dad is not going to hurt me. Right? That's to start at those very basic levels. We're moving up the ladder of trust here now. 
as we go on and on and on. And you know, I, 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 I'm learning as a little kid over and over and over that as, as my parents are providing structure for me, that uh, you know, the reason that they are parents is not, is not just because they want somebody to boss around. <laughs> that, that the reason that they are parents is because they actually want me to grow and develop to be an okay person. And that, that there is some structure that is in place that is actually for my own good. That, uh, you know, when they tell me no on occasions, it's not just because they're trying to punish me or attack me or rip away my sense of being. No, it's because they have a perspective that's different from mine. And most of the time they're telling me no, it's usually in my best interest. Okay? Now, there's a couple of things that go along with this. You know, first of all, my parents have to be present in order for me to go through this process with them. They have to be present physically and emotionally because I start this process of challenging them over and over and over and over and over and over. And, you know, if there's not some continuity there, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do this according to my developmental level. It's not going to happen. Okay? So, you know, obviously my parents need to be there physically and emotionally. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to work this through them with them. And the other thing is, is that my parents truly do have to have my best interests in mind, okay? If my parents are just faking it, or if my parents um, really are struggling with their own issues to the extent that their issues are at the forefront, I'm going to find that out as a little kid right away, that my parents really don't have my best interests in mind that there's some other weird dynamic going on, that something else is more important to them. Okay, so, you know, I, I, those, those things have to be in place. My parents really do have to be present, and they really do have to have my best interests in mind in order for me to figure that out. And there needs to be some consistency there. And, you know, if we progress along and keep going through this over and over and over and over and over, and, you know, by the time that... I get to be about 13 and 14 when I get that, that little spurt of neural development, you know, where the prefrontal cortex gets a little shot that's supposed to get me through adolescence in preparation for the final growth spurt that I get at about age 21, okay? Then, you know, at 13 and 14, it dawns on me. One day, I will wake up and it hits me as a kid gee, you know what? My parents actually do love me. In fact, I see my parents as beings who want the same thing for me as I want for myself. <laughs> and, and what is that that I want for myself? Well, I want to have as much influence in this world as I possibly can have. Now, really, as parents, that's kind of what we want for our kids as well, right? So as I'm looking at that and I realize my parents love me, I can trust that they want for me the same things that I want for myself. And I, and I recognize that they do have a perspective that's greater than mine, that they might actually know better than me what's best for me at this point. Now I, I start trusting my parents that they, they know something here. All right, now, when I get to that place, I can now move into that task of child, or excuse me, that task of adolescence, right? And this is where it gets really cool because it's no longer about me scrutinizing my parents any longer. It's no longer about my parents proving themselves to me, okay, that they are worthy of being my parents, that, that they're competent enough to be my parents, that they're smart enough, that they love me enough to be my parents, okay? It's no longer about me challenging them and scrutinizing them that they have to prove that to me. Now, it's about me proving my ability to my parents that I can manage the little piece of the kingdom that they are giving me to manage, okay? And, and that's important to me. Because really, what am I looking to do? Well, I'm looking to take over the kingdom, right? But my way of being able to take over the kingdom is showing my parents that I can manage the little chunk that I already have 
because I know when I show them that I can do a competent job of doing that, when they can trust that I can manage this piece responsibly, they're going to give me a bigger part of the kingdom. You know, and when I, when I handle that piece, they're going to give me more and more and more. You know, they're going to allow me to have more privileges in my life. They're going to hand me the keys to the car. They're going to allow that I have later curfews. Okay? They're going to allow that I have experiences that they wouldn't let me have if they didn't trust me. Okay? Now, the way that I get to that place where my parents actually trust me is by doing stuff that I don't really want to do. <laughs> right? Isn't that what it's all about? Now, now there's, a, a, there's a couple of things that happen here with this. Right? As, as I come to that conclusion that if I actually want some influence in my life, I realize that the influence comes not just by standing around waiting for it to fall out of the sky. Okay? That if I want influence in my life, it means that I have to do whatever must be done in order to obtain that influence. And most of the time, the stuff that must be done is not necessarily all that much fun. It's kind of a drag. It's going to school and paying attention in math class and doing an hour's worth of homework every evening. Okay? It's getting through those boring English les lectures and you know, writing the essay paper with the footnotes. Okay? It's doing those kinds of things. You know, it's like, yes, yes, everybody wants to be under the lights Friday night. But not everybody wants to have to go to two-a-days in August when it's so hot. Not everybody wants to have to go to every practice after school every weekday. You know? No, no, it's a lot easier for the rest of the world to just recognize my natural athletic gifts and realize that I'm on a plane so much higher than everyone else that I should be on the starting squad even if I miss practice. No, 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 no. You know, it's not getting that. It's realizing that if there is influence to be had, it is earned. And the way that I earn this is by doing things I don't want to do. Okay? And obviously, when I start this process, it will be due to some kind of an external structure that's in my life. This is what I got to do. But by the time that I get to be about 19 and 20, it's actually a self-discipline process. No one else is disciplining me at that point. You know, I'm doing it. I am the one that, are ma that is making those decisions to do that stuff that needs to be done. Now, the other great thing about this is once I start this process of doing things that are hard for me to do, doing things that I don't necessarily want to do, and, I, and I'm beginning to subject myself to some kind of discipline, by the time that I get to be 19 and 20 then, I actually have an identity that is based upon real experience. Okay? I know what I can do and what I can't do. I have that sense that if there is something that I need to achieve, I, I know what goes into having to do that realistically. And I, and I have this realistic understanding that you know, the, the position that I'm achieving or attempting to achieve as a young adult then is, is, is going to entail some action on my part. I'm going to have to put some work into it. It's not this whole idea that I magically turn 21 and all of the influence, again, falls out of the sky. The other part is, when I do get to be a young adult, and society now grants unto me all of the privilege and all of the access to influence that comes from being a young adult, I now have the wisdom and the discipline to be able to use that influence without self-destructing. Okay? I'm going to take what I have learned, I'm going to take this identity that I have and continue to build and grow, you know, and expand my regions of influence. I'll be ready to take over the kingdom at that point because I have some knowledge with you know, what I need to do with that influence. I'm not just going to self-destruct with all of that. Right? Now, the beautiful part about this is that during adolescence, I have a relationship with my parents that's based on mutual trust. 
I trust my parents that they know what's best for me and that they will allow me to do those kinds of things in my life that they know that I can handle. My parents trust me that I'm going to make good decisions. We're both working towards the same mutual goal of me becoming an independently responsible adult. It's actually a pretty enjoyable time in our lives. We're reveling in my accomplishments as an adolescent. You know, it can be an incredibly enjoyable time, absolutely. Now, if this is not what has been mirroring your own experience with your adolescent, let's go back and talk about this then, okay? And, and figure out, all right, so where does the process go awry, all right? We have to go back to that place where we're talking about the conflict again, you know? The little kid versus center of the universe conflict. And essentially what happens at, at that point in my life is that circumstances external to me, okay, this is going to be something outside of me, is going to make it so that I never have to have that experience of looking up, okay? Which means, which means that I, I don't actually get to this recognition that I'm down here on this little kid plane and that there is a separate existence up here. There's an entirely different plane up here, this independently responsible human being plane up here where all of the, the access is available. Okay? I, don't, I don't see that distance. I don't, uh, I, I, I don't get that piece. It, I may be willing to concede that I personally cannot, <clears throat> excuse me, cannot directly obtain that access to all of that influence that I think that I need. But I find out right away that all I have to do is just manage those in my life who can access that influence, okay? And as I manage them, it gives me that sense that, hey, I'm on an equal plane with them, all right? Yeah, they might be adults, but there's no real distance there. There's no real distance there. I, uh, you know, they, they pretty much do my bidding, and so, in the best case scenario, it, it, it puts me there on that equal footing. I'm right there with the adults. I will interact with them as my contemporaries, as opposed to recognizing that these are actually adults. These are actually my parents. No, no, they're my friends. They're my contemporaries. Right? We're on the same. I know as well as they do about what's best for me. Right? That's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is that I actually allow myself to be artificially elevated up here to maintaining this position of the center of the universe, or at least the center of my family dynamic. And there are a lot of things that can happen that allow this to take place, okay? If I'm in the middle of a protracted custody dispute, boom, it's a no-brainer, there I am, okay? You know, those kinds of things to where I actually see myself now in this position commanding all of this respect and, and fostering a mighty sense of entitlement where I have the expectation that not only my parents but all of the other adults in the world must continue to prove themselves to me that they are worthy to be whatever figures they are in my life. I will now go out into the world uh, with, with the attitude that not only do my parents have to continually prove to me that they love me, they care enough about me, that they understand me, okay, now, to, to be my parents, but all of my teachers must prove to me <laughs> that, that they are, are compelling enough to be my teachers, that the, the, that the material they are teaching is important enough to me, you know. All my friends must prove their value and loyalty to me, the society in which I live must prove its value to me. The legal system must prove its value to me. You know? So I, I go out into the world now where I will never do anything that I don't really want to do. And when things happen to me, it will always be somebody else's fault. You know, I'm going to get busted for possession, but it's the cop's fault because they had it out for me. And it's a stupid law anyway, okay? You know? And, you know, I continue to steal from my parents. Well, I wouldn't do that if you would just give it to me anyway. You know, it's always somebody else's problem and not mine. The rest of the world must prove themselves to me. You know, and I continue that process on and on and on and on and on. 